Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and, and welcome. My name is Jeff Bowyer, and as president of the Law Institute of Victoria, I sincerely like to welcome everyone on this fine Melbourne day. Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet, the Wurundjeri tribe of the Kulin Nation. I offer my respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. I'd also like to acknowledge some special guests here today. My fellow LIV Council members, Raynar Tang, immediate past president, Caroline Council, Stephen Sapuntzis, Simon Libus, Tom May, and Chief Executive Officer Michael Brett Young, as well as Michael Holcroft. I'd also like to welcome Victorian Legal Aid Manager, uh, Director Bevan Warner, Victorian Law Foundation Executive Director Joe Kirby, Victorian Bar Chairman Will Olstergren, representatives from the Legal Services Commissioner's Office, members from large law firm groups, community legal centres, small law firms, criminal law firms, family law firms and immigration lawyers. Hosting these uh, presidential leadership lunches is one of the privileges of my position and I sincerely welcome all of our LIV members and guests here today. As many of you would know, the Law Institute is extremely active in social media and if you want to join in the conversation, we're using the LIV events hashtag on Twitter. So go forth and, uh, and tweet. I'd like to also acknowledge the sponsor of today's lunch and thank Pitcher Partners for their continued support of these events and David Vasudi, and it's great to have you here again. Uh, your, your support is really sincerely appreciated and, and Pitcher Partners are a full service accounting audit and advisory firm with 43 partners and close to 500 staff in Melbourne. They have particular knowledge and understanding of legal issues affecting lawyers and legal practices and work with many of your firms and partners in Victoria and our firm has had a, a long and valued association with uh, Pitcher Partners and they've always met our needs. The Law Institute of Victoria's presidential lunch series gives an insight into thinking of some of Australia's most influential people. Um, there is no doubt that today's uh, guest speaker absolutely fits this bill. We'll gain insight into how the nation's number one lawmaker is thinking as of this moment. The Federal Attorney General is in a powerful position to influence not just your lives as practising lawyers, but the lives of every one of Australian citizens. He has a seriously prodigious workload at the moment dealing with some critical issues. Senator Brandis is responsible for any number of key government legislative proposals, and I just propose to mention a few. He has carriage of a new counter-terrorism measures to give security agencies more resources and legislative powers. He is actively considering proposals to force internet providers to store metadata of all Australians for two years. And we might have a quiz later just to make sure everyone understands what metadata is. He oversaw proposals to remove Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, which was taken off the table recently after concerted campaigning by a number of groups, including the Law Institute of Victoria. He last week released a Family Law Council report on parentage and the Family Law Act, which asked for government to actively consider who is considered to be a parent under the Act, and the baby gammy matter has brought that to the forefront of the nation's attention in recent weeks. He is the Minister responsible for the National Partnership Agreement on Legal Aid, funding of which has been a key concern for the Law Institute the Law Council of Australia, legal centres and advocates for several years. His government is in the High Court at the moment over the fate of 157 asylum seekers with revised cases to return to the court after the asylum seekers were moved to Nauru. He will also speak to us today about another High Court determination, Williams versus the Commonwealth of Australia and its implications for federalism. As you can glean, he has many issues on his plate and we appreciate Senator Brandis making time available to speak to us today. Senator Brandis will also, um, following lunch, speak to you, but he will also uh, kindly extend an opportunity uh, to ask questions. And so you, whilst you uh, digest your lunch, you can digest potential questions. And after lunch, I'll invite Senator Brandis back to the stage. Thank you very much. Senator Brandis graduated from the University of Queensland and after winning a scholarship to Oxford, he received a Bachelor of Civil Law and won the Sir Rupert Cross Prize. 
He worked at Minter Ellison before going to the bar in 1985, where he established a commercial practice specialising in the trade practices area. He was selected to fill a casual Senate vacancy in 2000 and re-elected to the Senate in 2004. He has chaired the Senate Economics Committee and in 2006 was appointed as a silk. Prior to, his, to the last election, he was also Shadow Attorney General. On the 18th of September 2013, Senator Brandis was sworn in as a member of the first Abbott Cabinet. He was appointed as Attorney General and also holds the position of Minister for the Arts, Vice President of the Executive Council and Deputy Leader of the Government in the Senate. I ask you all to please welcome Federal Attorney General Senator George Brandis QC. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Jeff. Can I also commence my remarks by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land where we meet? Um, can I acknowledge and thank you, uh, Jeff, as in your capacity as President of the Law Institute of Victoria, uh, Michael Brett Young, the CEO, um, William Olstergren, QC, the President of the Victorian Bar, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very flattered that so many of you should have turned out today to hear this address. This is, in fact, my second visit to the uh, legal profession in Victoria this week. On Tuesday evening, Will Olstergren entertained uh, myself and uh, Justice Beach at a function at Owen Dixon Chambers for uh, silks and commercial, uh, commercial solicitors. So uh, um, it's been a week in which my thoughts have very much been focused on the profession in Victoria. This, however, is the first occasion on which I've had the opportunity to address the Law Institute of Victoria. So thank you for your hospitality. The topic that I've been asked to speak about is the Williams decisions, uh, plural of course, and their implications for the federal system. One of the almost touching features of Australian constitutional law is the existence of a very small body of people who might be described as heroic constitutional litigants. Frederick Alexander James, who in the 1930s and 1940s remade our understanding of Section 92, Eddie Mabo, Professor Brian Pape, and now to that brief but illustrious list has been added a Queensland father of strong atheistic views called Ron Williams, who, as you know, brought two successful High Court challenges to the Commonwealth's funding of school chaplains and student welfare workers. Those with only a passing interest in Mr Williams's constitutional challenges could based on much of the media commentary, be forgiven for thinking that the challenges were about the merits of the National School Chaplaincy and Student Welfare Program, a program which was the product of the Howard government. Of course, that's not correct. In fact, the decisions turned on the somewhat drier and considerably more important subject of the Commonwealth's power to spend money, and they raise very interesting and fundamental questions about the role of Parliament in supervising Commonwealth expenditure and have profound implications for the operation of Australia's federal system. Historically, the Commonwealth had proceeded on the assumption that it had a largely unrestricted constitutional power to spend money for Commonwealth purposes. This position underpinned the Commonwealth's funding of school chaplaincy programs and many, many other programs, not the subject of constitutional challenge yet. The first step towards unravelling the traditional approach came in 2009 in the High Court's decision in PAPE. 
As you might recall, the court in that case rejected a challenge to the validity of tax bonus payments, the $900 checks um, issued by the Rudd government in its first iteration, paid as part of what was, they were, was uh, described as the stimulus package. One commentator at the time, correctly I think, described Pro Professor Pape's proceedings as the most pyrrhic defeat in the history of the Constitution. In finding against Professor Pape, the court rejected the Commonwealth's argument based on sections 81 and 83 that once money has been appropriated by the Parliament from the Consolidated Revenue Fund in the annual Appropriation Acts, it can be spent by the executive for any purpose. Instead, the court held that an Appropriation Act is merely the vehicle by which Parliament gives the executive government to, to permission to withdraw money from the Treasury. It does not also confer a, an independent power on the executive government to spend that money. The Commonwealth's power to spend must be found elsewhere in the Constitution and under statutes made uh, within power. The judgments in PAPE therefore laid the groundwork for what was subsequently decided in Mr Williams' first challenge, Williams number one, handed down in 2012. In Williams number one, the High Court held that the provision by the Commonwealth of funding to the Scripture Union of Queensland for the delivery of chaplaincy services to schools was invalid. In brief, the expenditure was found to be invalid on the basis that it was not supported by any legislation beyond an Appropriation Act, where it was a line item appropriation, and was not supported by the executive power of the Commonwealth under Section 61, which was one of the bases put forward by the Commonwealth to support the program. The decision in Williams number one meant that beyond agreements with the states or, the, or for, the, for the ordinary services of government, Commonwealth spending programs must ordinarily be authorised by legislation in addition to appropriation legislation. The court acknowledged some exceptions to that general principle, but the general principle is the, is the um, outcome of the court's reasoning in Williams number one. The then government, uh, the, by now the Gillard government, subsequently amended the Financial Management and Accountability Act, 1997, as the Act was then known, and the associated regulations to provide legislative authority for a range of Commonwealth spending activities. The time that legislation was passed through the Senate uh, in June 2012, I expressed scepticism about the efficacy of the mechanism that the Commonwealth had adopted and predicted that it would not survive subsequent challenge in the High Court. I made those observations because it seemed to me at the time that given the approach the Court had taken in Williams No. 1, merely to assert in a piece of legislation that a range of programs were within power did not meet the requirements that the court had in Williams No. 1 stipulated. In August 2013, predictably, Mr Williams commenced new proceedings in the High Court challenging the validity of, validity of the legislative arrangements made in response to Williams No. 1, and in particular, the payments made under the National School Chaplaincy and Student Welfare Program. The case was argued on a broad and a narrow basis. On a broad basis, which the court found it unnecessary to decide, Mr Williams challenged the validity of the amendments introduced by the, the then government to the Financial Management and Accountability Act to deal with the effects of Williams No. 1. On the narrow basis, Mr Williams challenged the validity of the National School Chaplaincy and Student Welfare Program itself. 